All right, so uh, welcome everybody. This is our January 2023 Lunch and Learn, specifically on the adjudicatory hearing. Um, so Mark Hudson is our presenter today and I'm so excited to have him join us. I will thank him tremendously because he is kind of pitch hitting. Uh, this was not on his agenda at all for today. And I asked him a couple of days ago if he could sub in for us. We had another attorney who was going to do it and then can no longer do it. So Mark, thank you so much for doing this. Mark is a uh, child deputy child attorney with the Office of Child Advocate. So I'll let Mark kind of turn um, to kind of introduce himself and I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Mark. Thanks, Lauren. Hi, everybody. It's good to see everyone. I see some familiar faces and some new faces. Um, so I'm Mark Hudson. I'm a deputy child advocate with the Office of Child Advocate. I've been here for um, going on seven years now representing kids. Um, and prior to that, since for about six years, I represented parents in these cases. So I've got both sides of the, the coin here that I've seen, and um, I've thrown together a little presentation today. I'm not very good with PowerPoint, but I did my best. So if there are, please don't judge me if things aren't looking perfect on the PowerPoint or if I mess up with the clicking stuff. But I'm gonna try to share my screen and we'll see if that works. And then um, I will get on with the presentation. All right, can people see my screen? Yes. Yep, we're all okay. set. Okay. Great. Okay, so today we are going to talk about adjudicatory hearings in these cases. Um, and let me see if I can make my screen change to the next one. All right, so I can. Success. So when we have these cases, um, there's a number of hearings that we have, and these I, I kind of tried to list some here in order. We have the preliminary protective hearing, which is the first hearing that we have with um, the court. In those hearings, there are um, sometimes the CASA is appointed by then, sometimes the CASA is not appointed yet. In that case, or in, in those cases, we are looking for probable cause to determine whether or not the child can continue to or, or needs to continue in foster care until a full hearing can be held. Those normally happen within 10 days of the uh, division petitioning for custody. And then the next hearing we have is the adjudicatory hearing, which we will talk about today. Following the adjudicatory hearing, there's a dispositional hearing where generally the Division of Family Services introduces a case plan for the parents um, on what they need to do to be reunified with their or with the children. And the court will review that and approve it if appropriate. That has to be held generally within 30 days of the adjudicatory hearing. Um, after those hearings, we have review hearings, which is where we come back periodically. Typically, it's every 90 days or so and review how the parents are doing on their case plans, review how the kids are doing in um, their current placements. There's normally, in a typical case, you know, we have to have a permanency hearing by about a year after the child entering into care, and that normally factors into about three review hearings. Um, at the end of that year, if the child hasn't returned home, then the court will have a permanency hearing. And at the permanency hearing, the court has to determine whether or not it's going to continue with its current plan um, for the child, whatever that may be. Reunification is most likely what it is if you're getting to a permanency hearing, or if it's going to change the, the permanency plan to something else like termination of parental rights for adoption, guardianship, permanent guardianship, that sort of thing. So those are the general hearings that you'll see in just about every case, unless the child goes home earlier before any of those can happen. And then after the permanency hearing, there's some other potential hearings you could see, depending on what the permanency plan is. Um, you can see post-permanency review hearings. Um, those happen, for example, if the court's going to continue reunification as the permanency plan, and then they'll come back again in another three months or so and have a post-permanency review hearing to see how things are going. If the court changes the permanency plan to guardianship or permanent guardianship, you could have one of those hearings, which is a trial to see if the guardianship or permanent guardianship should be granted. If the court changes the plan to termination of parental rights for purposes of adoption, then you can have a termination of parental rights hearing. If the court terminates parental rights, then you can have post TPR hearings where you come after you you come back again after the termination of parental rights to see how things are going in terms of the division finalizing an adoption or, or otherwise locating a permanent home for the child. And then for kids who turn 18 um, before they exit foster care, they can elect a, a and engage in extended jurisdiction in which the court will come back after they turn 18 um, to review 
how they are doing and what kind of independent living services that they're getting and make sure that those services are appropriate for them. So we're here to talk about the adjudicatory hearing and the big question is, of course, what is the adjudicatory hearing? Well, the easiest way of, of explaining it is that it is the trial. It is what you would think of, it is most like what you would think of if you watched something on TV about a court case where you have attorneys questioning witnesses, um, presenting evidence, objections being made, that sort of thing. So the purpose of the adjudicatory is to determine dependency, neglect, or abuse if it exists for the parents and best interests. So in other words, the court has to determine whether the child will be dependent, neglected, or abused in the, in the parent's care, and if so, whether it's in their best interest to enter the Division of Family Services custody. The result being that either the, either the court gives full custody of the child to the Division of Family Services, or if the division is not able to prove dependency, neglect, abuse, and best interests, then the, the court would order that the child be returned to one or both of the parents. And just bear with me, because I'm working on one screen here, so I got to make sure I'm getting all my notes that I made that I can't see otherwise. So I think I am. All right, I'm going to move on to the next one, maybe if I can get my screen back how it was. Yeah, all right. So the timing of the adjudicatory hearing, according to the Family Court Rules of Civil Procedure, it's supposed to be held within 30 days of the preliminary protective hearing. That's a guideline that's based on the Federal Adoption and Safe Families Act, or ASFA, which you'll probably hear periodically in some of your cases. That's a federal law that um, governs a lot of what states must do in order to earn federal funding and, and be able to kind of capture some federal dollars towards foster care reimbursements and payments and that sort of thing. So while they're just guidelines from the federal government, the Division of Family Services and the state tries to follow them so that they can be eligible to get funding from the federal government. Um, the 30-day timeline can be extended as deemed necessary by the family court. So often what we'll run into if, if we can't get something in within 30 days, it might be because scheduling the court's calendar is just full and maybe they can't fit the necessary length of time in their calendar within that 30 days. Um, it could be because the case is maybe a little bit more complex than a typical case and uh, attorneys have to engage experts or you know, kind of gather up some witnesses that they just can't do within that 30 day period. So the court has to push it out further. Um, it could be because sometimes the information that the division needs in order to present their case in some of the more complex cases is not quite yet available. And so they need to push it out further. So there's multiple reasons, but generally the court tries to get back within 30 days of the preliminary protective hearing in order to have the adjudicatory hearing. So the findings that the court needs to make at an adjudicatory hearing are contained within the, the statute in 13 Delaware Code section 2512B, okay? So they have to make, as mentioned before, findings as to each parent that the child is either dependent, neglected, or abused, and it's in the best interest that the child remain in DFS custody or be, be in DFS custody. They can do that either by a hearing on the merits or a trial, or they can accept an agreement of the parties that 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 is in fact the case so that the child is dependent, neglected or abused in its in best interests. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a little bit. Um, but so for dependency, so what dependency essentially, it's a defined term within the statute. And what it essentially means is that the parents have the, do not have the ability to provide the necessary care for the children. So whether it be because um, they don't have appropriate housing, they don't have the, the means to provide a safe environment for the children because of that, whether they, it could be because they are, um, they have mental health issues that are untreated that prevent them from being able to provide a safe um, environment and, and meet the needs of the children. So that would be a dependency situation. Neglect, on the other hand, is defined as the parents do have the ability to meet the needs of the child, but they're just not doing it for whatever reason. So that could be a situation where perhaps the uh, parents have are, are totally adequate in terms of being able to provide housing, education, that sort of thing, but they're just not doing it. You can see that sometimes in educational neglect cases where they're maybe not sending the child to school. 
Um, it could be situations where um, maybe they're not feeding the child appropriately, even though they have the means to do it. It's, it's, it's a wide swath of things, but that's it boils down essentially to they have the ability to do it and they're not doing it for whatever reason. Um, and then we have abuse. So abuse is probably easier to, to imagine what that means. It's physical abuse. If you're, it could be torture, um, child sexual abuse. Uh, it's more of, of easier to kind of envision what abuse entails. And then finally, the court has to, as I'm flipping back and forth here, has to determine best interests. And when the court considers the best interests of the child, they're not just thinking about some sort of nebulous idea that this is best for the child. They actually have specific factors that they have to look at contained within the Delaware Code. Those factors in a nutshell are they have to look at the wishes of the parent, they have to look at the wishes of the child, they have to look at the interaction and interrelationship of the child with parents, relatives, other people cohabiting with the child. They have to look at the child's adjustment to homeschool and community. They have to look at the child's, the, everyone's mental and physical health. So the child and the parents and anyone else who might be involved. They look at the parents past and present compliance with parental responsibilities, which is another defined term within the statute, but essentially it's just looking at making sure that the parents in the past or presently were doing what they needed to do for the child. They look for, uh, they look at evidence of domestic violence. So if there's any evidence of domestic violence within um, for either of the parents, they also look about if the child has been a victim of domestic violence. And they also consider the child's, or sorry, the, the parent's criminal history. They could also consider the child's criminal history as well, if that's significant. But generally, we're just looking at the parent's criminal history for best interest. So if the court finds either dependency, neglect, or abuse, and best interest, that it's in the best interest for the child to, to enter DFS custody, then the division will have an order of full custody to the child. Um, so the difference, I guess, between full custody, uh, term, I guess, can be kind of confusing. So when they have the preliminary hearing, the court enters an order of temporary custody to the Division of Family Services, which the division then holds temporary custody until a full trial can be held. And so the adjudicatory hearing is that full trial. And after the adjudicatory hearing, then they're granted full custody. Um, again, this doesn't mean that the parents can't get the, the child back. It doesn't mean that the parent, parents' rights are terminated. It just means that the division is able to, to essentially step into the shoes of the parents to make decisions for the child um, from, or on a day-to-day -day basis or delegate those decisions to someone else, like a foster parent, for example. There are only a, certain, a few things that the Division of Cert Family Services cannot do without the parent's consent once the division is, get, is given full custody of the child. And those things are, are typically like um, consent to psychotropic medications for the child or to have the child admitted into a mental health um, residential facility. Those things still require parent's consent, but other than that, the division can essentially act as a parent would in terms of making decisions for the child. At the, at the adjudicatory hearing, um, the court has to meet a certain standard or find us the evidence is compelling by a certain standard of proof. Um, so I've listed some different standards of proof that we see in, in various cases in, a, in the legal world. And I will, um, I'm actually going to stop sharing so everybody can see me because this is what I used to, I, I thought about trying to get pictures and see what I could do, but I couldn't figure out how to do it. So when I used to represent parents and I was talking about the standard of proof that the court was looking at, I would use my hands as the scales of justice, right? So we kind of think of it like that. And the one that most people are familiar with, I think, is beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's what courts use in um, criminal cases in order to convict people of different crimes. So when you're thinking beyond a reasonable doubt, the scales have to tip really far towards guilt in order for the division or for the, the state to be able to prevail. And going on the other end of the spectrum is probable cause. At the preliminary protective hearing, the court is only required to find probable cause that the child would be dependent, neglected, or abused, or that there's a safety risk to the child. So probable cause is at the other end of the spectrum. And that's just like the scales are tipping just a little bit 
in the, the state's favor. So the adjudicatory hearing, the standard of proof that the division is trying to meet is a preponderance of the evidence. So that's a little bit more in DFS's favor than it is um, than a probable cause standard, but it's not as much as clear and convincing evidence, which is what the Division of Family Services has to prove at a termination of parental rights hearing. So that means that we're almost getting to reasonable doubt level, but we're not quite that high, okay? It's hard because I can't really, I'm, I'm in a limited space that everybody can see my hands, but I don't know that I'd do any better in person anyway. So anyway, let me try to share my screen again if I can do that. All right, so at the adjudicatory hearing, the um, standard that the court's looking at is preponderance of the evidence, which is not an incredibly high standard, but it's certainly higher than the probable cause standard. So when we have an adjudicatory hearing, you'll, there are two things that can happen essentially. One, there can be a trial where the Division of Family Services has to put on evidence to prove that there's dependency, neglect, or abuse, and best interests that the child remain in DFS custody. Or there can be a waiver of the hearing, and that's essentially an agreement or a stipulation by the parties that the child should remain in the Division of Family Services custody. I suppose there could also be a continuance, but that doesn't resolve the case, so I'm not including that as, a, as an outcome here. So when you have a trial, that's what we think of when we watch TV, where we have the different parties presenting their cases. The Division of Family Services normally presents their case first, and they can call witnesses. Witnesses can include for the Division of Family Services, the Division of Family Services worker. There's sometimes an investigative worker who testifies, and there's sometimes an addition of a treatment worker, maybe, if there's an open case already with the division before the child actually enters custody. So maybe there's two DFS workers. Um, other typical witnesses could be a foster parent if the division calls them. There could be um, therapists or counselors involved who testify. There could be um, police officers or law enforcement officers, um, probation officers, that sort of thing. They might be called by the Division of Family Services to testify. They could call relatives um, or other personnel at maybe a hospital or something. And the, D the Division of Family Services may also present exhibits, which would be documents that they would admit into evidence in order to try to prove their case. Typical exhibits that the division might introduce could be, um, they might have a, a plan for child and care that they introduce, which is essentially their little written, written plan that they talk about what's going on with the child in kind of very general details. Um, and they might have other evidence to introduce depending on what's going on with the parents. They could have urine drug screen results they might introduce. They might have certified copies of criminal um, convictions that they might introduce. Um, but they have an opportunity to introduce exhibits. And then in certain cases, they might have experts they call to testify as well. And we normally see experts in cases of abuse where we might have a doctor testify and a doctor might testify about the injuries that the child occurred and what might have caused the injuries. Then after the division presents it, its case, depending on which county you're in or depending on which judge you're in front of, either the parents are gonna present their case or we're gonna present our case. If the parents present their case next, they normally have witnesses like the parents. They could call the parents to testify. They might have some relatives or friends to testify. If there are experts that the Division of Family Services calls, they might have their own experts to call as well. And they could also have documents like leases maybe that they want to introduce or drug screen results or therapy notes or something to show that they're in fact, you know, doing what they're supposed to or are treating the issues that the Division of Family Services alleges exist. And then there's the child's case, which will involve us. So in the child's case, we also get to call witnesses. The witnesses that we call would typically be the CASA. Um, could be the foster parents if they've not testified yet. Maybe somebody from the school. Um, if there's uh, issues with education that are, could be involved, we present exhibits. Um, our exhibits could be, you know, maybe like a report card or um, uh, other school records or medical records related to the child. And sometimes we call the expert witness instead of the Division of Family Services. So in some, some cases, we might call our own experts or instead of the division calling the expert, maybe we would call the expert and, and share the load a little bit. Um, 
And then the only other thing with a trial is sometimes there are opening and closing statements where the Division of Family Services and all the attorneys stand up at the beginning and say what they think is going to happen. And then they summarize at the end what they they believe happened during the case and what they believe was proven. And that's a general trial that you'd see. Um, in other cases, there might be a waiver or a stipulation. So in those cases, a parent might agree for the child, the child or children to stay in DFS custody so that they can get a case plan and start working on what they need to do. Um, when we have a waiver, generally, oh, I clicked the wrong thing. See, I knew I'd, I knew I'd mess up at some point. All right, so here we go, I'm back. All right. Oh, I forgot. There's possibly another aspect of a trial could include a, a child interview. So it's a, a possibility, depending on the age of the child, the developmental level of the child, and what the allegations are, that the court may interview the child or that a party may ask that the court interview the child. Um, in those cases, any party may ask that the child be interviewed, depending on the age appropriateness of it. Um, we might ask that the child be interviewed, or you might talk to the child and the child might say, I really want to talk to the judge about what's going on, in which case we would ask the, the court interview the child. So um, she could, she or he could just say whatever it is they've got on their mind. Um, that can happen depending on the child's age and the, the developmental level of the child. The child could give statements in front of everybody. The child could come into court um, kind of like a witness and say his or her piece in front of everybody and answer questions. But more commonly, we see a child interview being held separate from the actual trial. So the court would schedule a separate time and meet privately with the child. And often in those cases, the child's uh, attorney or a CASA or both might sit in on it with, with the child if it's what the child wants and it's more comfortable that way. Um, or the child might just say, I'm good, I wanna do it myself. I don't need anybody else there. So, but that's something else we could see as part of an adjudicatory hearing. All right, so then we move to waiver. So when we have a, a parents who are waiving a hearing, the first thing that normally happens is that the court accepts stipulations from the parents. When parents waive an adjudicatory hearing, they don't just say, I, I agree that the child stays in care and that's it. They have to actually give a reason. So if they stipulate to dependency, they have to give a reason why the child will be dependent in their care. So the typical reasons might be like, I don't have housing, um, I have a substance abuse problem that's not being addressed, or mental health problems that aren't being addressed. A waiver could be on parent-child conflict, where maybe they're just saying that we're not getting along right now, the child and I, and I can't have the child in my home because it's just not working. You see that more often with teenagers. Um, so the court will go through the stipulations with the parents' attorneys. And the court will ask the Division of Family Services and the uh, child attorney if the, everyone agrees with those stipulations. And most often people do agree to the stipulations and will throw in a little caveat saying, we agree to the waiver based on housing with the understanding that there will be other things in the parent's case plan. In other words, just because the parent says, I have a housing problem, doesn't mean the case plan is just going to say, get a house and the child goes back. There's probably going to be some other stuff included in there as well. After there's a stipulation, generally the court will hear information about the children still, and that information will come from witnesses like the DFS worker, foster parent, potentially CASA, and can hear and can receive exhibits too about how the kids are doing, report card, child and care plan from the division, et cetera. And in some cases where the division is expecting the parents to waive, maybe they've talked to them in advance and they've said they're going to do it, the division might already have a case plan prepared for the, um, for the parents. And in those cases, sometimes the court will just go right into the case plan for the parents and kind of combine the dispositional hearing with the adjudicatory hearing. So that gets things kind of moving a little bit faster for the parents. Um, So then we get on to the pros and cons of each. All right, so the pros of a trial are that the judge gets the full picture. The judge is gonna hear all the evidence that the Division of Family Services and OCA or CASA or whoever is able to present and make a decision based on the merits. So there's not gonna be any, there's typically not gonna be any concern as that the judge doesn't understand fully what's happening in the, in the case or with the, the parents and the child. The parents are going to hear the evidence. 
I think this is a pro because sometimes the parents maybe don't realize the extent of whatever issues they have going on. And if they sit in court for an hour or two hours or however long it takes and hear witness after witness saying that this is the problem, this is the problem, this is what we've seen, then sometimes that can maybe help them a little bit with buy-in that they need to actually address some issues. Um, and they see where the Division of Family Services and the court and everybody are coming from that the child's going to stay in custody. And another pro is that this front loads the evidence in the case. And so the, that doesn't really explain much. But in some cases, um, if you have a waiver at the beginning of the case, the court doesn't hear any evidence. The court doesn't really have much information in terms of why the child is in custody. And if the case doesn't result in reunification with the parents, you might get to a termination of parental rights hearing. And the court still not heard that evidence about all the, you know, drug use in the home or the mental health issues that the parents were having that were so, you know, damaging to the children and, and so problematic. And so then at the later stage, you might need to have that evidence presented because it wasn't ever presented to begin with, just so that the court, when it's making that ultimate decision about termination of parental rights, has it in front of it. Or sometimes if the Division of Family Services is not going to case plan with a parent, and this is something I, I will talk about a little bit later in the presentation, um, if the parent waves and doesn't and DFS doesn't put on the evidence, then they might have to put DFS might have to put on evidence at a dispositional hearing to show why it should not have to case plan with the parents in those cases. Okay. Um, there are, of course, some drawbacks to trials as well. The biggest one being that we don't know what's going to happen if we go to trial. Um, we might think we've got the best case in the world and DFS has it locked up and then the judge just sees things entirely differently and the parents might, you know, there might be an outcome that is not what we wanted. So that's the biggest con. Um, another one that's uh, pretty big is that it, it, it's very time consuming. Some of these judicatory hearings can take one day or two days or three days. Some of them can take several hours at, at, and some of them might get scheduled farther away than we want them to be scheduled. Like I mentioned before, that 30 day time period that the court's supposed to try to follow, it can be extended depending on the circumstances. And so when you think of a two day, if you think of a, a adjudicatory hearing taking two full days of the court's time, um, which sometimes happens, you shouldn't think of it as being like, oh, well, when we go, we'll go that week, we'll be there Tuesday, we'll be there Wednesday, and then it'll be done. It's normally not that way. It's normally you'll go one week for, or you'll go one day for a day. And then weeks or months later, you'll have your second day of the hearing. So it can really delay things, you know, having these long drawn out trials because the court's calendar just can't accommodate consecutive days for these cases. And then the final con is one that's not quite as intuitive either. And that's that it, having a trial can limit what the Division of Family Services puts on their case plan. So case plans are designed only to, to fix, I guess, the problems that the parents have. They're not so designed to just kind of throw everything at the wall and, and make them jump through a bunch of hoops. So if the Division of Family Services goes to court and they have a trial for an adjudicatory hearing and they say, mom has a drug problem, mom has mental health issues, mom has a housing problem, and the court ultimately concludes, you know, I don't think that mom has a mental health problem. You know, the evidence isn't compelling or, or it doesn't show that mom has any mental health problem. Then the Division of Family Services technically should not be putting any mental health services on the parent's case plan because the case plans are designed to remedy the issues creating the dependency, neglect, or abuse, if that's the case. So, so those findings can limit what's put on. On the other hand, the pros for a waiver we know what the outcome is going to be because there's very, very rare is it that a court will say, I don't accept everyone's stipulations. Everybody agrees to this outcome, but I'm not going to do it. That's very, very rare that a judge would not accept the stipulations of the parties if they are all in agreement. So we know what's going to happen. It uh, moves the case along quicker. It's we're not having to wait, you know, for weeks to go back for a second day of trial, if that's the case. Um, and as I stated on the last slide, sometimes the dispositional hearing can get moved into the adjudicatory hearing if the parents are waiving and that case plan can get adopted and kind of get the parents on that road to working on things even faster. 
And then there's more flexibility drafting the case plan. Like I said, when a parent stipulates and, and waives a hearing based on housing, for example, it's normally stated on the record and it's understood by the judge and the parties that there are gonna be other things on the case plan other than housing. So the Division of Family Services has a little bit more flexibility to include other things on the case plan that they didn't necessarily have to prove at court. Now it could be disputed at a dispositional hearing and the parents' attorneys could come in and say, there's no need for this or that on the case plan. But generally, once you get past the adjudicatory hearing, there's not as much arguing about what goes on the case plan in general. And then of course the cons for a waiver is that the court does not get the full picture of what's going on. So the, the, if parents say, I stipulate the dependency based on housing, then the court won't hear any evidence about the drug problem or the mental health problem or the domestic violence that was going on in the home, that sort of thing. So the court doesn't get that full picture. Now they might get parts of it later, but they're not getting it at the actual trial. Um, and, and, and like I said before, the, like another con would be you might have to present evidence at a later time. So at the termination of parental rights hearing or at another hearing if DFS says that they don't want a case plan with the parents. So as, the, as we discuss the outcomes of the hearing or the court finds that it's that there is dependency, neglect, or abuse, and it's the best interest for the child to remain in DFS custody. That can be after trial or after a waiver. And then what that means is Full custody is awarded to the Division of Family Services. The court should be establishing a visitation or contact schedule with the parents if it hasn't already in order to get visitation um, kind of squared away for everybody. And then the court should be scheduling a dispositional hearing to go over the case plan or a review hearing if the case plan is, is wrapped into the adjudicatory hearing. If the court does not find dependency, neglect, or abuse, or best interest as to either or both parents, then the children would return to the custody of the parent or parents. And importantly for us, we're done. There's no further involvement from the child attorney. There's no further involvement from CASA. Whether we're happy with that outcome or not, we, we're done. Now the Division of Family Services can stay involved and sometimes they might keep an open case, an open treatment case with the family for a period of time after custody is returned to parents. But it's not a case. It's not a case that's monitored by the court, and it's not a case that involves us anymore. Okay. Um, one thing I did want to mention too about um, the the trial and the adjudicatory hearing is that there are no default default judgments. So in other cases, in other courts, like if you sued somebody for breaking a contract or something, and they don't show up to court then the court's going to enter a, a default judgment against them. You don't need to have a trial. The court will just say they're not here to defend themselves. They lose. In our cases, we don't have default judgments. So if the parents don't show up to the adjudicatory hearing, the Division of Family Services will still have to put on evidence about either parent who didn't show up in order to, to get that order of custody from the court. All right, so the CASA's role. Our role throughout this is we are advocating for the best interests of the children. Some states have a statute that says that guardians ad litem and attorneys who represent kids are advocating for the child's expressed interests or expressed wishes, sorry, but that's not Delaware. Delaware, we're strictly a best interest state. So how can we advocate for best interests during the adjudicatory hearing or how can the CASA do that? First, I think it's important that CASAs familiarize themselves with the case and the children as best as possible. Like I said, I think ex my experience is varied, but most of the time the CASA is getting assigned after the preliminary protective hearing. So you're kind of behind the eight ball a little bit playing catch up in this kind of 30 day window between the first hearing and the actual trial. So the best thing you can do is familiarize yourself with the case and the children. Oh geez, I hit the wrong thing again. All right, there we go. Coordinate and collaborate with the CASA attorney or, or the CASA coordinator and the child attorney. I think it's very important that we all stay involved with one another and know what's happening. Um, you might have to testify at a hearing. That's a way of advocating for the kids at the, at the adjudicatory level. And if the children are present in court or if they have a child interview, we can certainly advocate for them by supporting them at that hearing or at that child interview. And so for preparing for the adjudicatory, 
for familiarizing yourself with the case and the children, I think the best, best first thing you can do is talk to the CASA coordinator. Uh, I'm not on that side of things. I assume that's probably happening in every case as soon as you get one that you're talking to a CASA coordinator. But talk to the CASA coordinator. If ever in doubt and you don't know what you should be doing or, or what you should be working on, talk to the CASA coordinator and they can assist you and kind of point you in the right direction. Um, reviewing records and, and requesting records. I believe the coordinators request the records, but if there's something that you think you need, talk to the coordinators about getting it. You should be getting a copy of the um, petition, I think, that has the allegations that DFS has made against the parents and reviewing that is important. Reviewing any other records that we have access to, whether doctor's records or school records, that sort of thing can be helpful in, in familiarizing yourself with it where everything is. Um, and then you can talk to the DFS worker. Um, so what should be happening with the child attorney in these cases is they should be making sure that the DFS attorney is okay with the CASA talking to the DFS worker directly without any attorneys around. I'd say that 99% of the time the, the, the DFS attorney is fine with that. They would in fact prefer that. So if there's permission for that, talk to the DFS worker. Um, you don't need permission to talk to foster parents, talk to foster parents. You can talk to teachers, therapists, relatives, whoever else might be involved to try to kind of get an idea of where things are and what's going on with the case. Um, I think it's important that you try to meet the child or visit with the child as soon as you can after you receive the case, especially if we're pre-adjudicatory so that you can kind of get an understanding of where that child is, what's going on with the child. If it's a young child, meeting with the child often gives you the opportunity to speak to foster parents or maybe daycare workers or something to see how the child's doing, see if there are any concerns with what's um, the development of the child or anything, any other concerns about what's going on with the child. It's important to remember when we meet kids and interview kids or, or visit kids, we're not interviewing kids. So if there is a case where there are allegations that the kid was, you know, beaten with a belt or something, it's not our job to go in and talk to the kid and say, so what, how did you get disciplined when you were at home? That's not our job. Our job is just to talk to the kid um, and try to figure out where they are and what's going on. There are many, there, there's an entirely different process for interviewing kids who've been, you know, subjected to abuse or, or bad conditions like that. And quite frankly, the people who are involved with that don't want us screwing it up by talking to them and getting different answers and, and doing other stuff or, or, you know, putting them through more trauma because they have to relive the experience talking about it again, or maybe they give contradictory statements and it's not generally helpful. So we want to talk to them, we want to meet them, but we don't want to interview them and, and you know, grill them. So you can ask things like where, you know, if we're pre-adjudicatory and they're an old enough child that's, you know, developmentally able to kind of express themselves, you can ask where they would like to live, or do they want to go back home to their mom and or dad? And if they say no, you can ask why not, but we're not going to get into specifics or anything like that in, in terms of our questions. Um, we can ask if they have relatives who they know and they would maybe want to live with if they couldn't go back to their parents, that sort of thing. Um, and I think it's also important, depending on, again, on the age and, and developmental level of the kids, if they to ask if they would like to be involved in the court hearing or if they would like to speak to the judge separately. Um, because like I said, at the adjudicatory hearing, the judge will often or can often meet with the child separately and talk to them about what's going on, what their, um, what their experience is and, and what it is that they desire. So, um, what we do not do a lot of times is talk to parents before the adjudicatory hearing. So part of your job as CASA is that you are going to be encouraged to reach out to parents and figure out kind of where they're at and what's going on with them. Um, however, prior to the adjudicatory hearing, since that's the trial where the parent attorneys are trying to win and get the child to go home with the parents and end the case, most parent attorneys do not want the CASA speaking to their clients prior to the adjudicatory hearing. So if that's something that you're very anxious to do, make sure you're reaching out to the coordinator and the attorney to ask about whether that's something you can in fact do, and it, it might not be. So, and then if for communicating and coordinating with the CASA coordinator and the child attorney, it's important that you prepare a CASA report. Um, the coordinator should be sending you a form that you fill out that kind of has 
breaks down, you know, detail by detail what's going on with the child and what's going on with the family. Those are really helpful um, for everybody involved, I think, to, to be able to get your perspective on, on what's happening and what's important and what's not as important. Participating in the triad meeting with the CASA a coordinator and the attorney is important. So the coordinator should be setting up a meeting with you shortly before the hearing in order to meet with the attorney and meet with the coordinator and talk about the case um, and what's going to happen, whether you might testify or not, what's um, the big concerns, what are the little concerns, that sort of thing. And then I think it's important with the coordinator and the attorney to ask questions that you have and share concerns that you have so that we know where you are and, and we know that you, you know, there's not any questions that you have that aren't answered so that we can work better as a team. And let's see. So preparation for testifying at the hearing. Um, I know a lot of people are nervous about testifying and it's really generally not so bad um, for the CASAs. For the most part, people will treat you very respectfully and nicely and will not be grilling you or anything. You know, there's not gonna be harsh cross-examination. But some of the things you can do to prepare is again, talk to the coordinator and the child attorney. At the triad, most of the time, I think we talk about are we going to need the CASA to testify? What is the CASA going to say? You know, what are we going to ask the CASA for? And I think most of the time the attorneys can give you a, a pretty good idea if you're going to be needed to testify. And if so, what you're going to have to testify about so you can kind of prepare yourself. It's important, I think, to review if you are going to be testifying to review notes and your report prior to the hearing. Um, so that you want, you know, you kind of your memory is your, your memory is refreshed. When you are testifying, you should not have anything in front of you. So you shouldn't have record, you shouldn't have your CASA report in front of you. You shouldn't have anything if possible. Anything that you do have in front of you that you need to testify from um, can be shared with the parent attorneys and the DFS attorney. So that's why specifically we don't want the CASA report in front of you when you're testifying because that's a document that's just for us. That's not to be shared with the parent attorneys or the Division of Family Services or anything. So my recommendation is if you've got some complex testimony that you have to get give, which you probably won't, but if you do, then maybe you want to write down some dates or something on a little sheet of paper, something that you know, like if other people see it, you're not going to be upset that other people had to look at it, because if you're looking at it, they might have a chance to do that. Um, when you're testifying, it's important, I think, to try to only answer the questions that are asked. These hearings are long. We're often going at the end of these hearings. Um, judges' patience is sometimes thin by the time we get towards the ends of these hearings because they've been sitting for a long time listening to stuff. And we want to make sure that we're not duplicating stuff that's already been testified to, that we're not kind of just going out and testifying to things that nobody's, that the judge isn't looking for, that the attorneys aren't asking you about. So try to keep your, your answers limited to the actual questions that are asked. And then relax, because like I said, it's nerve it's nerve wracking to be testifying, but it's it's not going to be so bad. You guys are not the bad guys here and people generally are not going to treat you as such. So just try to relax when you have to testify. And then so what can we do to prepare to support the kids at the hearing or interview? So sometimes we might have kids at the actual hearings. At the adjudicatory hearing, it's less likely that we're going to have kids there because at the adjudicatory hearing is kind of where all of the stuff about the parents gets aired out. And it's often not very good for the kids to be there to hear all the nitty gritty details about what's going on with mom and dad. But sometimes, depending on how old the kid is or depending on the developmental level, they might be there for part or all of the hearing. It's possible. So we can support the kids during the hearings by you can, if you've met them and you feel comfortable and they feel comfortable, maybe you'd sit with them during the hearing, if it's possible, if it's appropriate. Um, if, you're, if you're sitting next to them, or even if you're not, you can keep an eye on them maybe, and you can give a little nudge to the child attorney or text if we're on Zoom for some reason and say that you think that the child is feeling uncomfortable or might be overwhelmed so that the child attorney can maybe try to pause the hearing and address whether or not the child needs to leave or, or should leave or, or we need to take a break or something. So if you're noticing that with the child who's at a hearing, please you know speak up so that because we might not always be paying attention to that. Um, and if there's an interview for the child scheduled, I think it's good for CASAs um, to attend those. 
like I said, some children might say that they want to just do it by themselves. They don't want anybody else there. But I think that even if they don't want you in the courtroom when they're interviewed by the judge, it can be good to go with them and sit outside in the waiting room and wait for them to come out, talk to them beforehand and talk to them afterwards about how, you know, to make sure that they're more comfortable because a lot of kids are kind of nervous going in and talking to the judges, even in a kind of informal setting of a, of a private interview. So I think it's good to attend any interviews that the kids are, are scheduled to have. All right, so when we're at court, when we're actually sitting there in the courtroom, or before we get to the courtroom in this case, introduce yourself to the parents. So if you weren't assigned at the PPH, you probably weren't at the PPH, you've probably not met the parents in person maybe. Um, so before a hearing, and I think it's important to do it before the hearing, um, you can introduce yourself briefly to the parents. Um, it doesn't have to be a lot. You're not there to interview them or grill them or anything, but you can just say, hi, I'm so-and-so, I'm the CASA. I'm going to be working with you on this case. I just wanted to introduce myself. I think it's important to do it before the hearing because after the hearing, sometimes people are not in the best mood, um, especially if things didn't go the way they wanted to. So parents after adjudicatory hearings could be grumpy. Um, they could be talking to their attorney and kind of debriefing about what happened because you know their attorney has to kind of get them get them refocused and and console them and everything so after the hearing not the best idea and most of the time to, to go up to the parents and, and start you know introducing yourself and everything they're probably not going to be as receptive during the hearing i think it's good if costas take notes it just helps you engage in the hearing and and you can certainly you know note anything that's important you'll have it for later so if there are questions about what happened at the hearing that sort of thing um, I, it's, write your questions down. If we're sitting next to each other in an adjudicatory hearing, write your questions and, and give them to the child attorney so that the child attorney can, you know, see them. If it's questions that you have for a witness, the child attorney can, you know, use his or her discretion about whether or not to ask them. If it's questions about what's actually happening, the child attorney can maybe, you know, help you get answers to those. If you're on Zoom, then normally I think the coordinator will set up either a text or an email chain for you guys to communicate with during the hearing. Um, and lastly, be professional, and we're not trying to react to things. Sometimes people will say things in adjudicatory hearings that are unintentionally funny. Sometimes they will say things that are just makes you scratch your head and, and think that, you know, there's no way that that person's telling the truth. Um, sometimes they'll say things that are just, you know, flat out fabrications, and you know that they're fabrications, but we have to, you know, we're here to be professional. We're trying to keep a straight face. Um, we're trying not to, to, you know, react in big ways to anything that happens in court. After the hearing, um, I think it's good to talk to the coordinator or child attorney, at least briefly, to kind of debrief about what happened. Sometimes there might be questions about what happened, to talk about next steps. Um, sometimes after the adjudicatory hearing, there's not a decision. So as the judge might not rule from the bench after a hearing, um, they might take the matter under advisement and you don't have a, a real outcome yet. So talking to the child attorney can help, you know, explain what's going on with that when you might expect something to happen. Um, they can give you kind of a better idea of what the next steps are or what the how things went. The child attorney can generally have a good feeling about how things went or didn't go. So. Um, talking to everybody afterwards is is important, I think. Um, it can also give you guys ideas for what you should be working on now that we're past the trial. So what, what are your next steps in terms of talking to the parents now that we're past the adjudicatory or maybe scheduling a visit with the kids, um, scheduling to observe a visit with the parents and the kids? Um, so I said maybe talk to DFS or the parents. So I said maybe because I think that depends a lot on how things went. Um, DFS might be busy talking to their attorney. They might not have a chance to, but it's a good opportunity if you're all there in person and the DFS worker is there to talk to the DFS worker. Maybe you can get some contact information for people that you don't have already. Um, maybe there's some relatives involved that you don't have the contact information for, or maybe there's a therapist or counselor or, or someone who, you know, you need to get in touch with and the DFS worker should have that information, but you don't. So after that, after the hearing can be a good time to do that. Or if the parents are in an okay spot, like maybe after a waiver, for example, if they waive the hearing, then maybe you can talk to the parents and talk to about about exchange contact information, you know, even set up a time to talk with them or something like that. 
Um, and then there should be a triad hearing scheduled um, for the next hearing. Hey, Mark, we actually do have a question in the chat if I could ask it now. Oh, boy, yes, do. <laughs> I love it. Um, so question is, do the child attorneys want or appreciate communication from the CASA when new information is discovered, not specifically during a court hearing, but basically between court hearings, meaning if the CASA speaks to a therapist and gains some helpful information, is a short email helpful, um, and is it appreciated? I can only speak for myself. Generally, I think yes, though. I, I definitely would like to know things that are happening in between hearings uh, because we don't want to be the last ones to hear. And sometimes there's things that we might need to do um, based on that information before we get to the next hearing. So my, my personal preference is that if you're going to share that information, share it by an email with a copy to the coordinator and me. Some attorneys might want you to just email the coordinator and let the coordinator kind of relay the information on um, to the attorney. So I think that's probably, a, should it be shared with someone? Yes, it should, at a minimum, I think it should probably be shared with the coordinator um, if, it's an, if it's significant developments in between hearings or in between meetings with the, the attorney and the coordinator. Um, but I would say at a triad, at one of your first triads, it's probably good to talk to the attorney about how do they want do they want to be on every every communication, you know, about updates, or do they want it to go to, through the coordinator, or how do they want to do it? But yeah, I, I think important it's important to get updates in between hearings. And that question actually reminded me about something that I wanted to say earlier, and I forgot. So when we were preparing for the hearing, um, and you meet with the child, or you talk with the foster parents, it's very important that um, the if there are statements from the child which are um, could be helpful for the hearing, you know, maybe that, and, and I'm just giving some examples. Maybe the child says like, you know, oh, every time I got in trouble, my, my, you know, mom beat me with her flip-flop and, you know, I had bruises on my butt for days or something. Um, if they say that to you, if they say, if, if the foster parent tells you that they said that to them or somebody else tells you that they made these statements, that's important for the a child attorney to know because um, we can get those statements into to evidence often without the child being present, but we need to have advance notice of that. So when a child says something, and if I want the CASA to testify to something the child said, or I want the foster parent to testify to something the child said, I have to provide advance notice to the other attorneys about what the child said and what I expect the testimony to be. And then they have an opportunity if they want to ask that the child be interviewed. So, uh, but if we get to court or we get to a, a triad, you know, a triad shouldn't be the day before court, I don't think, but if they are the day before court and that's the first time we're learning about it, then we don't have that opportunity to provide the notice to the other attorneys and we might not be able to get the statements to the child in to evidence um, without that child actually going into court and saying it themselves, which we try to avoid the best we can if, if about things like that if possible. So that's just something else that I that I meant to say earlier and, and neglected to. Which ties kind of into these serious physical injury and abuse cases. So there are a separate set of cases which are kind of different than all of the others. And those are the serious physical injury and abuse cases. Traditionally, these cases were assigned just to the deputy child advocates and there were not CASAs involved, but I believe that we're starting to branch out a little bit more and some CASAs are getting cases that involve serious physical injury, um, abuse, sexual abuse, or child death. So it, it's, you won't, chances are you might not see one of these, but they are popping up more and more. So I thought I should at least mention it briefly. So these cases kind of follow a different pattern than the other cases, because if there are certain circumstances in place and the division of family services can ask not to case plan with the parents. Um, so DFS normally when a child comes into custody, they have an obligation to provide reasonable efforts towards reunification for that, for that set of parents for a period of time. And that's why they do the case plan. And that's why we have the review hearings and the parents, you know, get help from DFS doing what they need to do. But if certain things happen, DFS does not need to provide those services to the parents. So the certain things that, that, that can happen that relieve DFS of that obligation are if there is intentional abandonment. We don't see that very much, um, quite honestly, because if there's intentional abandonment, normally the parents aren't involved at all. So it's, it's a weird situation, but that's one of them. 
if there are certain convictions or adjudications of delinquency against the parents. So if the parents are convicted of a felony level offense against a person, that person being a child, then most of those felony level offenses would relieve the Division of Family Services from case planning with them. They can also be convicted of, child, of, of endangering the welfare, the felony endangering the welfare, and that would relieve DFS of its obligation to case plan. If they have a prior involuntary termination of parental rights, the DFS does not have to case plan with them. So if they had another child in DFS custody in this state or in another state, and that child's rights were involuntarily terminated, in other words, they did not agree to it, DFS put on evidence and they lost, then DFS does not have to plan with them again in the future. So they don't have to prevent, give them a case plan. Uh, if there is torture, chronic abuse, or life sexual abuse, or life-threatening abuse um, caused by either the parents to any child, then they can be relieved of case planning. Again, these are things that the division has to prove in order to be relieved from case planning. Or if there is unexplained serious physical injury near death or death caused by the parent um, or by their reckless disregard for the child or, or negligence, then the child can be, or the division can be relieved from case planning. So these are, are the more serious cases generally. Prior, prior involuntary termination of parental rights is not is generally a, a pretty easy matter for DFS to prove. They just introduced the prior court order terminating the parent's parental rights, and that's the end of it. But the, and same with convictions or adjudications. But things like torture, chronic abuse, sexual abuse, life-threatening abuse, physical injury, near death, death, those are complex cases that normally involve law enforcement testimony, they normally involve um, expert medical testimony, and they are normally much more contentious than regular cases. Um, and they are normally the ones that are your two to three day adjudicatory hearings that are scheduled, you know, months out instead of 30 days from the preliminary protective hearing, that sort of thing. Um, was that all I had on that slide? No, that wasn't all I had. There we go. So, in, so when we have cases like this, um, DFS could sometimes ask, try to make these findings at the adjudicatory hearing. Again, so this is like the front loading of the evidence that I talked about, where they try to get this information out at the beginning so they don't have to do it at some later point. So if they're doing that, then in those cases, they might ask for those findings to be made by clear and convincing evidence, which when we talked about the standards of proof earlier, that is the one that's just a little bit higher than the preponderance of the evidence. Um, they ask that because in order for them to be relieved from case planning, the court has to make the findings by clear and convincing evidence. And they have to make those findings in order to be relieved from case planning by clear and convincing evidence, because when you get determination of parental rights, the findings have to be made by clear and convincing evidence. So in those cases, there can be some um, there could be some talk about having this happen at the adjudicatory hearing. And like I said, these are generally your more complex and lengthy hearings. Um, you won't see much of these, I, I don't think, hopefully, if you're lucky, but they are popping up more and more often and some CASAs are getting assigned to these cases. So I just wanted to talk about it briefly. Um, and I think that's I think that's all I had on here. Yeah, and that's it. I don't know what time it is because I, I can't see my clock. Mark, you're right on point. It's exactly one o'clock. <laughs> oh man, look at me go. You nailed it. All right, so that was it. Thanks everybody. I hope it was helpful and it wasn't too much um, in the weeds or anything, but we're, the attorneys are always here to, to help if you have questions in any of these cases, as are the coordinators. So we appreciate you guys volunteering your service and uh, it's a really important thing that you're all doing and we're happy to have you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you, everybody, for attending. I will give you your one hour of training credit. Um, if anybody else has any additional questions, you can uh, shoot me an email and I can uh, kind of work with um, any of the specific attorney. If it's a case specific question or anything like that, we can go from there. Otherwise, have a wonderful day.